Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope that you're having a great day. A special greeting to the specialists who participated in the previous panels. I'm Isabella Rose, the communications officer for the Inter-American Inter Committee Against Terrorism of the Organization of American States, SICTE and OAS. It's an honor for the OAS to attend and share our experiences during DEF CON 31 this year. With over 15 years of experience, our program is a regional leader in helping OAS member states develop cybersecurity capabilities at the technical and public policy levels. Its initiatives and activities aim to ensure an open, secure, and resilient cyberspace throughout the Western Hemisphere. The program's three main objectives are, first, to support the OAS member states in developing technical and political capabilities to successfully prevent, identify, respond to, and recover from cyber incidents. Second, to enhance strong, effective, and timely information sharing, cooperation, and coordination am among cybersecurity stakeholders at the national, regional, and international levels. And third, to increase access to knowledge and information on cyber threats and risks to public, private, civil society st stakeholders, and internet users. Beyond the breach, exploring cybersecurity policies with hacker perspectives will be a discussion that explores the role of cybersecurity policy hackers in responding to cyber policy challenges that governments and organizations face in the current rapidly evolving landscape. We'll focus on the importance of cybersecurity policy hackers in shaping and advancing cybersecurity policy, the challenges in developing effective cybersecurity policies, and the need for collaboration and innovation in the field. A special thank you to the panelists for taking the time to share their valuable perspectives at this event. Today, we are joined by three professionals with excellent international projection. First, Mauro Vigetti, advisor in digital technologies of warfare at the International Committee of the Red Cross. Second, Orlando Garces, cybersecurity officer of the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism of the OAS. And finally, Andres Velasquez, cybersecurity expert and the founder of president of Matica. So, the field of cybersecurity policy is constantly evolving, and as such, the need to think innovatively and critically about policy solutions to address new and emerging threats. But when we talk about cyber policy, we can do it from the organizational, governmental, or international levels. Andres, let's begin with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and from your experience, share with us the following. How can Latin America and the Caribbean, private and public organizations, foster a cooperative and trust-based environment to encourage hackers' participation in initiatives to enhance cybersecurity policies? Thank you very much, Sabella. It's uh, a great honor to be here. Uh, because actually I attended one of the first, well, at least six, one of the six first uh, DEF CONs. And when I started working after that with law enforcement, I wasn't able to come here again. If you're familiar with DEF CON, uh, there was a, something called Spot the Fed. So probably people that were intended on working with government were not actually kind of allowed here. Um, this has changed, and, and I'm very pleased that that has happened. So pretty much what I have done in, in the last 20 years is uh, create specifically the cybersecurity and most of the law enforcement agencies in terms of digital forensics, in digital intelligence, some of the most important cases in, in Latin America. So even that I'm on the private sector, I have been working a lot with, with government in terms of 
bringing new technology, new 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 ways of of, of looking and how how to to uh, to find out where are the people that are attacking us. You know, uh, trying to to be as clear as possible. So, one of the biggest things and, and the challenges that you you mentioned is, I think that something that we have been we, we should be talking about is mistrust. Mistrust between government, hackers, and sometimes academia. So that mistrust is probably one of the first things that we are, we're having a, a big challenge and we have to do a paradigm uh, shift. Specifically, if, if, if we see the great value that we can have on, on the education, on cybersecurity, and how can we can work all together. Back in the days, one of my first tutors, the agent uh, Lugo from the US Secret Service, showed me a, a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. I don't know if you have heard about it, Cliff Stoll. It, it talks about uh, an astronomer that back in the 80s from Berkeley in, here in the California was able to, using you know, whatever he had, uh, a way to find out who and when his server was hacked. So pretty much it's a story about a hacking, uh, uh, an intrusion, and how he was able to figure out where they were doing it. Long story short, and no spoilers around, he was able to find out that it was not in the US. That was the first time that I learned about jurisdiction, something that hackers and policymakers don't really understand. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we have right now in Latin America. Because most of the time, everything when we talk technology oriented, is based in the US. Considering that, every single time that we need information from the states, we need to go through mutual uh, treaties in order to get the information. And that can take five, six years just to arrive to the states, and then another five years in order to get back through the normal processes. So if we, if we look at this context, what we can start, you know, and, and trying to, to put some, some ideas in, in the table. I think that another challenge is how we report vulnerabilities in Latin America. In comparison to the states, we do not have any policy. We do not, not have any regular way of doing it. If you, hacker, report a vulnerability into a Mexican, uh, Colombian, Argentinian uh, company, probably, they will try to sue you and start a criminal case. Why? Because we don't know what to do. And that's the real reason of, uh, of that. In the other side, we have these legal protections that we need to, to figure out how to, to make it happen, you know, clear frameworks on how to report and how to work together. And that's most, uh, or, or gets into the point that we need to understand as, as Latin American countries, that the hacker is not the bad guy. And that's one of the most important things that I can, I can share with you. We could do, and, and I expect to do a lot of collaborative workshops, recognition and incentives uh, that will motivate so we can start working together. The reality, and at the end, and I will finish with that, right now, our biggest challenge is that we do not work together. That's really interesting, Andres. Uh, thank you so much. Now, Orlando, you have been involved in several OAS technical assistance projects for the formulation and implementation of national cybersecurity strategies and policies in multiple countries in Latin America and the Caribbean region. What challenges do uh, Latin America and the Caribbean region governments face in engaging the hacker community during the life cycle of national cybersecurity policies or strategies. So thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Orlando. Uh, hi, Andres. Hi, Mauro. Hi, Isabella. Uh, well, I, I work for the OAS, that is Organization of American States. Uh, we have a, an Inter-American inter Committee Against Terrorism there. Uh, and. Over the last eight years, I've been, you know, involved in some technical projects uh, regarding the uh, formulation and implementation of national cybersecurity strategies uh, in the region. So um, 
let me let me. I I, I have to apologize to Mauro and, and Andres because I'm, I'm I just want to share to the audience, uh, you know, the Latin American experience uh, regarding this type of of, uh, of uh, you know exercises that we have done there. So uh, the the OAS CICTE uh, cybersecurity program uh, has been the you know the regional leader in the in Latin America and the Caribbean in providing you know technical and policy levels uh, cybersecurity capacities. Uh, these initiatives aim to ensure an open, secure, stable, resilient cyberspace uh, throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, out of uh, the 35 member states uh, of the OAS, 19, more than a half, uh, have formulated a national cybersecurity policy or a national cybersecurity strategy. Uh, 11 of them with OAS assistance. Uh, Colombia, for example, have formulated three national policies. Uh, uh, Chile has formulated two national cyber strategies, cyber policies. Uh, the Dominican Republic and Panama, two uh, uh, national cyber strategies. Currently, in, in the region, there are four countries, uh, most of them in, in the Caribbean. Barbados, Guyana, the Bahamas, and Uruguay that are formulator, formulating their first national cybersecurity strategy. And there are four countries formulating their second one. Uh, there's Argentina, Costa Rica, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. We have, I have to highlight you know, the experience in Costa Rica because uh, last year the, the, the country has, well, has faced uh, a major, some major cyber attacks. So uh, even though, you know, the, uh, this is very important for, for a policy action in, in the region, even though OAS uh, has been around for about 15 years uh, helping uh, the member states, nowadays more and more uh, international community actors are getting uh, involved uh, in cyber policy making in the region. So we have other global international organizations such as the United States uh, through the ITU. We have regional organizations uh, uh, such as the European Union that it's very, uh, they are very interested in the, in the region. We have CARICOM in the Caribbean region. Uh, multilateral development organizations such as the World Bank and the, uh, in, uh, the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, other independent states, for, for example, you know, the United States are uh, providing a lot of help uh, in our countries and a lot of uh, private sector companies. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the policy making processes uh, in the region has, uh, has a lot of, uh, you know, actors trying to uh, get involved. So uh, there, you know, the, the capacities, there, there are like intermediate level capacity and, in the, and the cyber capacity maturity is in, in the intermediate level. So uh, multi-stakeholder approach is like, uh, uh, it's been using since 2015. And, um, and uh, right now the current generations of policies are working on most of, most of the time in governance models uh, and also working on, on um, uh, trying to uh, get involved, you know, this, the, all the, the multi-stakeholders in the ecosystem, uh, in uh, cybersecurity ecosystems. So uh, that's what is going on in the region. We are a very small team trying to do a lot of uh, things in, 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 uh, in Latin America. And what Andres just said, you know, there's lack of trust. And, you know, the main challenge in the region right now is that, uh, uh, you know, the authorities that are in charge of formulating a policy or a national strategy uh, lack of a technical understanding of what cybersecurity vulnerability research entails. And sometimes uh, our countries, you know, uh, presents uh, uh, only the malicious hacking point of view. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, they have this nar narrative that this type of research 
uh, should uh, be penalized. So uh, the region has uh, facing a, a lot of challenges involving uh, technical communities like uh, the hacker community uh, because there are like a fear and hostile reaction from the authorities and legal sanctions. We have a lot of legal barriers, uh, an absence of a safe legal framework, and, uh, and, of, and, uh, and lack of coordination between uh, public officers and who are dealing with policy making with uh, you know, the hacker communities and, and the technical communities. So that's what I'm about to say. Thank you so much, Orlando. Mauro, you have been working for a, a while in cyber, cyber policy at the international level. Please talk to us about your expertise. How can hacker perspectives contribute to balancing cybersecurity measures and preserving online privacy and civil liberties in developing and implementing cybersecurity policies for global organizations like the ICRC? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I think I'm uh, the only non-AOS uh, panelists here, so the goal here would be to uh, expand the view from an international perspective. So I'm working for the International Committee of the Red Cross. You probably know the ICRC, so we are based in, uh, in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, it's uh, probably the largest humanitarian organization worldwide. We have operations in more than 100 countries, and uh, we mainly work in a situation of armed conflict. So those are very challenging situation. Uh, it's very challenging uh, work we have there, and we are facing uh, situations that are requesting uh, uh, a very uh, important response. So in this regard, also in the digital space, we are confronting with uh, such challenges. And um, there are two main uh, aspects in this regard when we operate uh, in the digital space. First, because also the ICRC has to digitalize its operations. Uh, to provide services to our beneficiaries. And as you may know, the beneficiaries of the ICRC are people that are suffering from uh, the consequences of armed conflict. So we have to digitalize our operation to be able to reach out to them to be more performant. And because the society is digitalizing, and also, also the armed conflict are digitalizing, so our response must be also at this level. And the second one is because we are, we are facing an increasing uh, uh, politicization and, uh, and uh, polarization of, uh, of the digital technologies. So we know that there are, uh, there are companies taking stand for one party to conflict or the other. And uh, the ICRC is a neutral and impartial organization. So we have to be able to provide the services respecting our independence and uh, our um, um, uh, neutrality. So that said, uh, I would like to bring you a couple of examples on how we engage the hackers community and how we work with them. So the first one, uh, you, you probably may know the, the, the emblem of the Red Cross. is a Red Cross with a, black, with a white uh, background. So we use this to signal the protection of assets during armed conflicts. So we put the emblem, for instance, on the rooftop of our warehouse not to be bombed, or we use this to put on, on our vehicles that we use to transport uh, goods and people. So this is a signal of protection. So we, we say to the parties of the conflict, do not shoot this because it belongs to uh, an international humanitarian organization. So we are trying to transform this and translate this into the digital space. So we are in a, in a project where we are digitalizing the emblem of the Red Cross. How to signal operations that are uh, uh, on cyberspace and say, hey, those assets are protected. Please do not attack those servers, those networks, and so on. So how we do this? So we engage with the hacker communities last year, and uh, we suggested a couple of technical requirements that uh, they have to, uh, to take in account, and we asked them to help us to provide uh, some prototype of how to digitalize the emblem of the Red Cross. And they come up with uh, some ideas, they criticize our ideas, they put new ideas in, and so we're developing uh, this. We publish a first report in November on the digitalization of the emblem, and this is how we engage with the hackers. We saw a very interesting response because probably is one of the first time they, think they can work 
without uh, thinking about there is money in place, so is, the goal is, is a humanitarian goal, it's completely different from a bug bounty or other, other, uh, other situation. So this is one first example on how we engage with the hacker communities. Another one is uh, um, because of the respect of the, our neutrality and independence from, uh, from digital technologies, so from digital technologies of the private sector. So we opened uh, a delegation for cyberspace in Luxembourg last year. And uh, one of the main uh, goal of the delegation is to engage the hacker community to help us to develop open source tools that are independent from the commercial one to be able to have a backup or situation where we cannot use a, a commercial services, commercial product, but also to respect the information and the protection of information that our beneficiaries uh, provided to us. So we have a duty of respect those uh, information. So we are developing with the hacker communities and, uh, and we're going to come in uh, 2024 asking more from the hacker communities to help us to identify venues to be able to uh, 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 produce and develop such independent uh, uh, tools that we're going to use in our daily work. Thank you so much. Now, Orlando, given the, this international overview, what are the national policy approaches in the Latin American and Caribbean region to promote ethical hacking by enabling professionals to use their skills to identify and fix vulnerabilities in computer systems. Well, as, as I mentioned before, you know, the, 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 the Latin American is a very special region uh, in terms of uh, maturity level. We are at the intermediate level. Uh, of course, each country is totally different. Uh, but uh, we could think about three like approaches. The first one would be, you know, uh, creating legal frameworks. Uh, that's very hard because it's not only you know the, the, the executive branch dealing with that. It's it's uh, it's uh, talking with the legislative branch because we need to modify or, or try to create a, a law uh, to to you know to to try to. Uh, uh, deal with this uh, with this situation so i uh, i could brought uh, here one example is uh, it's uh, the uh, experience in chile right now uh, chile is working uh, it's uh, you know there's a law on a cybersecurity and critical information uh, infrastructure that is about to be approved uh, by by uh, the national assembly or congress and uh, there is one article there that, uh, that exempts uh, from criminal, criminal sanctions ethical hackers uh, who have, uh, for example, committed acts classified as computer crimes, uh, but carry on, for example, investigation work in computer security. So uh, they exempt uh, these type of actions as long as they comply with certain conditions, uh, for example, uh, immediate notifications, uh, among others. So that's one thing that, it, that uh, in Latin America is going on, uh, but uh, Chile is the, the, the best example. The second one, the second approach is um, uh, that promoting ethical hacking, but uh, through the national cybersecurity strategies or the national cybersecurity policies. Uh, for example, the Dominican Republic uh, government issued uh, last year uh, the brand new uh, national cybersecurity strategy, and they included uh, responsible vulnerabilities uh, disclosure as a guiding principle of the strategy uh, in order to create a more secure digital environment to promote uh, the use of ethical hacking uh, techniques. So, uh, of course, we have, uh, we have other countries, but uh, for example, the, the Colombian and, and, and the Ecuadorian NCS, they just mentioned uh, the establishment of uh, procedures for the promotion and dissemination of a model of uh, vulnerability disclosure, but they have to comply with the law and what, what, uh, what and just what, what Andres just told us before, uh, in Colombia and in Ecuador is totally penalized this type of actions. So uh, they are trying to, you know, to, to work from the, from the executive branch to, to work on that. And finally, some countries that uh, don't have 
uh, policies or cybersecurity policies, but they are working on national guides. But uh, just for uh, you know, for uh, for information sharing and, and just uh, responsible risk disclosure, but but uh, but not very well uh, framed. So uh, that uh, that's what is going on right now in, in, in the region. Perfect. Very interesting, Mauro. A couple of years ago, you were tasked to create a vulnerability management unit within the National Cybersecurity Center in Switzerland leading several projects, among them the first bug bounty program of the Swiss government. What are some successful European examples of collaboration between hackers and governments or organizations in shaping cyber policies, and what was the key to success? Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, prior to uh, my engagement with the uh, ICRC, I was working for the National Cyber Security Center in Switzerland, and. Uh, we decided it was time to uh, to have a, a, a bug bounty program inside the vulnerability management for the for the Swiss government network, and uh, so we built up this. Uh, um, but uh, was not just using hackers to find bugs, but we developed the program with them. So we gave them our necessity, and they come up with an idea on how to build a, a bug bounty program for. Uh, the national uh, government. So, as you have to understand, uh, Switzerland is a is a confederation. So, it's like uh, we have uh, 20, 27 cantons. It's like it's like the U.S. with the states. So, we have the same situation: the federal government and then the the, the cantonal uh, government. So, and this was a little bit challenging. So, how to build a program that has to incorporate all the all the party of the of the country? So, they, we come up with the idea of having a central. Uh, a central uh, um, platform uh, paid by the, the, the government and then having the different cantons uh, paying the, the, the bugs, uh, pay the bounties to have, uh, to have them testing uh, several uh, cantonal um, uh, assets. So the same idea uh, we would like also to implement uh, for, the, for the ICRC. So this is uh, something that uh, we can replicate also in other contexts for other countries. So having uh, uh, having a central uh, platform for, uh, for the ICRC, for instance, but the ICRC is not just alone. We have an entire movement composed also by the national societies. So the American Red Cross is one of them. We have uh, in every country uh, a, a society. So one of idea could be to have a central, uh, a central platform for the ICRC, but having also bug bounty programs for the national societies of, of uh, Red Crosses that can uh, join this effort. So having the hackers community working for also for the national societies, not just for the ICRC. Thank you. Now, Andres, an essential dimension in national cybersecurity strategies or policies in the region is the fight against cybercrime. Could you talk to us about the role of cybersecurity policy hackers in the ongoing evolving landscape of digital investigations and the associated challenges in Mexico and the rest of the Latin American and, and the Caribbean region? So as I mentioned, you know, the, the cybercrime is a big thing in Latin America. And, and if we try to understand why, first of all, we have to say that there is not enough awareness on, on cybersecurity in most of our countries. And I'm not talking about the technical people. We're talking about you know, the, the people that are on the streets and even the government. Uh, the other thing that is, is uh, starting to happen is that government knows that there's a threat. But they don't know how to stop it. So they're trying to create these uh, there's national strategies that most of them are uh, on a preventive side. But they're not including you know, how you prosecute, how you investigate, how you, and there's a little thing here that, that is uh, probably what I'm more concerned of. That is how we interact, how we uh, do uh, cross-border access in order to get evidence from other countries. And then where is it, it comes something that is kind of different from what we're used here in the States. Uh, the States is based on an, an uh, English system, so it's precedence, so, so things move faster than what, what happens in our countries. We're uh, based on, on codes. So in order to change the law, that could take more than six years. So we're not doing everything in, in the speed that we, we, sh we should. In the other hand, 
the, the malicious actors are finding out that that's an advantage. Why? Because right now organized crime is using people from Mexico and in other countries in order to hack from Mexico or to Mexico knowing that nothing is going to happen. So if we, if we uh, put everything uh, together. I think that the policy hackers have to be the frontline defenders. You know, right now is our only option on how we can work together in order to uh, identify those vulnerabilities and, and weaknesses before the malicious uh, attackers are, are finding them. The issue here is if we build something in each one of the countries, if we make a collaboration in between these, these hackers and we try to get uh, to the government, we need them to trust us, as we were mentioning. And then we need to build the way we can work together and will be uh, legally correct. Again, the reason that, that uh, some countries are going against policy hackers is because that's the way the law is coded. So we have to change, change that. Then we, have to, we, we need to understand that there are some challenges outside uh, you know, the technical side. Limited resources in terms of the, of the governments and how, how we can do that. That limited resources, I'm not talking about just money. Uh, lack of uh, standardized cybersecurity uh, policies. Uh, and that uh, we need more legal frameworks in order to combat cybercrime. If we uh, combine this with the training like the one that the OAS is, is doing in Latin America, as well as the Council, uh, Council of Europe, so you can tell that most of the training that is done in, in Latin American countries is not made by Latin American countries. We're actually getting people from other countries uh, in order to help. And I think that what we should be doing in, in the near future is try to standardize the cybersecurity strategies all around the region. And when I'm talking about the region, I'm not just talking about Latin America and the Caribbean. So we need to do all Americas, you know, how we can work together in, uh, to make that happen. Great. Now it's time uh, for the audience to ask a question. So we have time for one question. Yes. Yep. Um, so my question is, how are you seeing the cybersecurity options in a moment where we're moving away from the U.S. tech-wise and accepting Chinese technology asset security systems? For instance, Huawei has become our autonomous partner to do the 5G mm -hmm. system, uh, but we still use Amazon Web Services to keep everything with us. And this connection will, at some point, no longer be possible if that difference The future that I foresee is not very good. The thing is how, what we can do right now in order to not get into that, that future. Uh, the experience that I had in Brazil was amazing. Brazil actually found out that there was so much corruption inside the federal police that what they did is pretty much they created a new entity specifically with academics and uh, people from the private sector that were willing to change that. And when they did that, everything changed, at least on the federal side. They were not able to do it on the, on the state side, uh, but that helped a lot. Talking about cyber security is even worse because uh, as you know, there are not enough cybersecurity experts in the region. Right now, uh, the last uh, report from IC, IC, ISC squared is that we need 130,000 specialists this year in Latin America. So I don't know, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that specifically. Uh, at least, you know, I can tell you that 
Orlando, myself, we're trying to do stuff in order to make people understand. My, my personal experience is, if I train the DA, if I train the expert witness in each one of the Latin American countries, at least they're gonna start doing their job correctly. But I cannot change the legal system. And that's kind of coded. Uh, well, I, I work for a political uh, organization. Uh, we are, uh, you know, the OAS has um, member states and we work by their mandates uh, for the whole Americas. Uh, but one thing that, you know, you're, what, what you are saying is something that is happening in the region that, that you know, cybersecurity is not a state problem, but it's a governmental problem. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, countries uh, that uh, as soon as they switch government, they change everything. Uh, uh, and, and that's very costly for, for the region and for the, for the country. Uh, what, uh, you know, the OAS is focusing right now is trying to, uh, you know, work on uh, robust uh, governance models in, 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 in the countries because uh, lack of leadership and lack of uh, uh, coordination and collaboration mechanisms could uh, lead you into that type of problem. So uh, that's, that's a, one of the main problems in, in our countries, is that uh, we don't have uh, you know, a, a robust uh, governance model. Uh, we don't have a, a, um, that type of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, expertise. So uh, we are working right now with trying to help uh, you know, the countries in, in order to uh, bring everybody to the table everybody to discuss, uh, even if it's, uh, if it's uh, you know, uh, the, commu the international community and, you know, the international community is very broad and, and uh, it covers uh, well, the whole uh, globe. So uh, uh, each country is independent. Well, for example, we have to take into account uh, best practices in the region, for example, uh, Dominican Republic has a very, very, very good, uh, you know, uh, governance uh, structure there. They have a, a, a cybersecurity agency. It's one, one of, uh, one of the, uh, I think it's the uh, one out of uh, five countries that in the region that has, uh, you know, a cybersecurity agency. Uh, right now, uh, there are some um, countries uh, such as. Uh, Chile and Colombia that are uh, trying to pass uh, bills, you know, uh, cybersecurity bills, uh, trying to to design this type of uh, agencies. Uh, so what I what I, I have to say is that uh, uh, we look forward as an OIS, we look forward to to bring the discussion, including everybody, all these multi stakeholders, and and that could build, you know, uh, strong uh, national cybersecurity strategies and policies. Yeah, can, we have time for one more, yes. Thank you. Um, my name is, uh, is Ira Victor. I'm an ambassador for the Center for Internet Security Controls. Um, we've, the CIS controls have been used uh, in the United States to create a legal incentive for public and private entities to adopt information security and privacy best practices. Uh, have you, have, have you, or the people in your in your worlds been looking at uh, an incentive-based approach for public and private sector to adopt an international standard for information security, either the CIS standard or one of the other ones? Well, of course, we we uh, we encourage the member states, you know, to to be involved in this type of uh, initiatives. Uh, 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 when we go to the, to the countries, to the member states in, in Latin America, we try to, to invite you know, uh, people with a lot of expert, expertise on, on the subject. So 
uh, we try to bring you know as 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 much as we could you know technical people technical you know people who organizations who have worked on on those type of standards and procedures, and uh, what we try to do is try to open the discussion, try to debate, bring everybody to to the region, and uh, of course uh, we we are, we are going to take a look at what you are saying, and and and. and uh, and, 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 and try to, to show it to the region. So. I know that Argentina actually s saw into that, and, and actually uh, Claudio is around here, is part of the, of, of the group, uh, but it didn't went through. So it's a matter also on how, how things are presented to the decision makers, the government, and how we can make it happen. Most of the, the ways that in Latin America works, it will work after they have a catastrophe. You know, something that affected not the, the a company, but really the government. So we're talking about, you know, uh, if, if, if we're talking about Mexico, it, it should be Pemex, you know, or, or the CFE that is the electrical uh, grid. So until we don't have that, and, and, and the probably I'm going to say something that I didn't want to say it, but I'll say it. Most of the times it's a matter on they are thinking like this. If I do not have the electric grid connected to the internet, why I should bother, you know? And we know it's an issue, but it's, a, it's more in, in terms of we need to generate so much awareness on those levels that probably one of the best ways of doing it is waiting when the new generation start getting into the decision making uh, inside the companies so we can change that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.